some exchange betting companies run short-lived promotions, like months-long offers of low commission. At BetDAG, we wanted to change the way we did things, so we set our commission at 2% permanently. That's 2% on football, horse racing, golf, almost any sport. 2%. That's just one way that BetDAG is changing for the better. For the better, like you. BetDAG, the 2% commission exchange. Over 18s only, please gamble responsibly. Hello everyone and welcome back to the Roper Report podcast where we do not have an awful lot of good news to share. What we are here to tell you today is that Sunderland have um, achieved two more uh, one-all draws and I think perhaps achieved is the wrong word in hindsight of about five seconds ago. So yeah, that's that. Um, it's not looking particularly great, I'm afraid. I think our playoff hopes are all but scuppered. Um, a result which we threw away at Peterborough after taking the lead and then a unsatisfactory draw at home to promotion rivals Portsmouth leave us in a position where it's going to take a mathematical miracle for us to secure second place so yeah I suppose it is what it is it's not the not 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 the not the most positive environment I think in the in the uh, university studio today but it is what it is I suppose anyway uh, joining me today to uh, bask in the disappointment of Sunderland first of all is Josh making his return to the studio I well know Josh yeah, yeah, I'm well, thank you. Yeah, yeah, I'm not too disheartened by the recent events of Sunderland. You know what? No, no, I choose to be eternally optimistic. I think. No, oh, well, I, I wish I could do Just that. Just my Josh. own sanity, yeah. more than anything else. Well, hey, if it works for you, then more power to you. Because <laughs> I can't do that. We're also joined in the studio by another local reporter and also something of a Twitter pantomime villain. It is <laughs> Jimmy Lawson, who is better known as the man behind the player ratings. Public enemy number one yeah, in cue the, the studio, yeah. Cue the audience booze. <laughs> <laughs> How are you doing, Jimmy? Yeah, very well, thanks. Yourself? Yeah, n- not too bad. I'm not too bad. Thank you very much for asking. I always appreciate that. Uh, I take it you got to the game yesterday? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yes, good to get up to Sunderland, good to be up here. And to be honest, good performance, just a frustrating result, which yeah. we'll obviously touch on in more detail. Oh, completely, yeah. And finally, we are joined today by our special guest, which is Jeff Brown from BBC Look North. How are you doing, Jeff? Not too bad, yes. Yep. Nice sunny day outside. It is, it Great is. Great day yeah. to be inside and in a, in a bunker. <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. Scorching outside. <laughs> Absolutely. And I take it as well that it probably goes without saying that you caught the entirety of the Portsmouth game yesterday. Yes, yeah, yeah. Uh, pretty much a game that was much like Sunderland season. Not yeah. decent in part, not too bad, just not good enough, yeah. really. Um, yeah. Well, the, yeah, 19 draws this season. That, that well, just, that's, uh, uh, it's a pretty damning testament to the um, the maybe just the, the lack of that little jolt of energy just to get over the finish line, I suppose. So we'll get onto those, as Jimmy said, in a bit more detail. But just before we get right into the nitty gritty, um, I'll provide you guys who perhaps haven't seen the last two games with a brief summary, followed by our three-word review as per making its return after the four-word review um, uh, briefly took over last week amid our temporary optimism. So, Sunderland played Peterborough on Monday night and played, as you would say, pretty well throughout the majority of the game. It was quite an end-to-end affair. I think both teams were fairly evenly matched, but many of our fans suspected that we would have perhaps had a little bit more quality, which was almost realised when Max Power struck late on from outside the box with a lovely satisfying strike into the bottom left-hand corner, which gave Sunderland what seemed to be the winning goal. But sadly, only a handful of minutes afterwards, uh, Peterborough got one back. Um, a, 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 perhaps a lapse of concentration in defending allowed oh, Matty Gooden I think Matty, Matty Gooden yeah thanks Jimmy I'd totally forgotten his name there but mm-hmm. again and, and which was admittedly a very good strike from outside the box but a lack of a lack of perhaps concentration and a lack of closing down allowed Peterborough to get back into the game and ultimately meant that two very valuable points were lost and following on from that one all draw was another result above the same scoreline Sunderland yesterday drew one all with Portsmouth initially taking the lead through Tom Flanagan only for Jamal Lowe to equalize about 15 to 20 minutes later in a game which Sunderland could have definitely won had Craig McGillivray not have been some absolute Manuel Neuer-esque world beater for some infuriating reason but again we'll we'll get to that in more detail and just how just how infuriating it is that um, Portsmouth didn't have a standard league one keeper and for some reason had this absolute world beater in net but Hey ho, time for our three word review before we start talking about the real stuff. As is always the case on Twitter, we asked the people of Twitter for their three words to summarise the last week as a Sunderland fan, so let's get to it. Graham Field says, not going up. 
Jake Collinson says Pompey at Wembley. Phil SCFC73 says now rest McGeady. Chad Jarvis says playoffs it is. James Anderson says not over yet. Owen Hill says thanks, son's crying. <laughs> she is son's crying, nice one. Jessica Reed says playoffs, playoffs, playoffs. Mark Mason says Covent Garden beware. Jimmy McCullough says still going up. John Place says feels like 1998. Jeff Richardson says poor managerial decisions. Magic Matthews says too many draws. Sean Gunner Graham just says James Vaughan and then a crying emoji. The, the, the <laughs> laughter one, of course, because, you know, again, he was just as tragic up front as he was for us. Charlie Taylor says always the bridesmaid. <laughs> like that one. Pretty apt. David Watson says wasn't to be. And Paul Taylor says disappointed but optimistic. So I think as far as this season goes, that might be our most um, despondent collection of player ratings. But of, of player ratings, sorry, I'm thinking about you there, Jimmy. Our most despondent collection of the three word reviews. But it's uh, it's not without cause because uh, really those have been two very disappointing games. So for the sake of starting chronologically, let's start with the Peterborough game. We'll throw this one to you, Jimmy. What did you make of that game overall? I thought we were pretty good. I mean, sort of you look back on the game and it really came down to those chances in the first half. We had that 10-minute period where Wyke misses the one-on-one, where Jimmy Dunley scores twice from the corner. Their goalkeeper once again made two great saves. And really what hurt us was not getting the lead before half-time and having something to build on. And from there, you had a really even second half. We score... I was furious, furious leaving the ground with their equaliser and then watching it back was a bit gutted to have to accept that it was a good finish. Like, I was, yeah, I was fuming in the car back, sort of with Oz Turk. And whilst it was bad from him against even Tony, it was just a really, really good finish. And sometimes you have to tip your hat. But yeah, it was, it was just sort of a close game between two good teams. We had the chances to win the game. We didn't take them. And yeah, in a sense, like we've talked about already, that's sort of the story of our season, being good but not quite good enough. Well, if we aren't quite good enough, what do you think was missing on the day? We'll throw this one to Jeff. Speaking of the Peterborough game, what did you think, as Jimmy's highlighted, a very a very sort of a recurring theme is maybe just a, a lack of quality. Where do you think that lack of quality lies, so to speak? Hmm. Um, in that particular game, I mean, the equaliser it was a great strike, but Tony had about, when I looked at it back, they had about four or five defenders around him and he still managed to hold the ball up and lay it off. And that has been one of their failings this year. They, they just, at the back, the team lacks a bit of muscle, a bit of, uh, you know, when, when they, they come up against big strikers, big bustling strikers, they seem to, you know, through the season, he's, he's gone more for um, Baldwin and Flanagan, guys who can get the ball down and pass it around. But you know, he's obviously decided Ozturk's going to come in. He does what he does, doesn't he? He, he gets it, he wins it, he kicks it away. <laughs> he gets it away. <laughs> um, but on that occasion, he was out-muscled and it was just uh, so disappointing when the whole picture would have been so different if they'd held on. And won that game because the, the, the atmosphere for Portsmouth would have been even better. I think he's bad against that style of centre forward. Sort of, I was really, really relieved that Hawkins didn't start yesterday because if he sees someone that's stronger than him, he just thinks, I'm grabbing you. I'm grabbing you. I don't care. If the referee calls it a foul, it's a foul. If not, I'm grabbing you. And yeah, the second Tony came on, it completely changed their attacking outlook. And I think the word's probably passive. Like you think about Jimmy Dunn not getting out to Gooden, and you think about his lack of confidence. There was a point in the game, you might remember, it was a little point, but I was late by my ticket, so I was right behind the dugout, so I could see James Fowler and Jack Ross, where Dunn does a Cruyff turn and pass it back 40 yards to McLaughlin, and James Fowler was out. He was like, no, no, we told you to play it simple, no. And then the whole way through the game after that, Dunn's confidence was gone. It was completely gone, and I think that's maybe the problem that we've got two talented centre-halves that maybe lack physicality for this mm. league and then two other centre-halves that just don't have the confidence or the ability to oh, be in a promotion-chasing side. It's a little concerning, though, if something like that has knocked his confidence that much. Because that for a professional footballer, that's, you know, if a, if a manager's or a system manager's calling out to you saying, no, we, we didn't tell you to do that, do something yeah. different, you should just check that on the chain and be like, yeah, OK, fair enough, um, you know, I'll sort it out, rather than being like, oh... 
you know, I'm not doing it right. Yeah. You know, that's a bit of a yeah. concern. Yeah. I think what we should be perhaps quite wary of, and I think one of what which is still one of my biggest concerns with our with our centre backs, whichever the pairing may be, whichever combination we seem to go with, we seem to be left with two two lads at the back who lack experience either in terms of age or in terms of appearances made I mean if you look at Dunn and Ozturk when that was announced as the starting back pair against Doncaster I was terrified because for me you had a lad who was very young very unproven and looked to be a bit short of confidence coupled with the lad who you know not only looked very mercurial in pre-season but also was barely played and is now playing at a very pivotal point in the season I, th- I think it's very interesting that um, uh, that Fowler, uh, as you said, you you heard him. You've heard him quoted saying that we told you to play it simple. Well, I, I didn't hear that quote, but that was the message I got yeah. from sort of the hand actions and the right. way he was shouting. I, I assumed that's him saying no, no, not like that simple, because that was what was relayed. I, I watched the Doncaster game on television, and that was what you heard Don Goodman saying. They've been told to keep it simple. They've been told to do that. And I interpreted that as him going against the grain, taking a risk. And the whole idea is they don't take risks. I mean, you could see that in the Doncaster game. A lot of five-yard passes, difficult passes to 09 and power. Because the idea is these are the better technical players. They get us up the field. You do your job, let them do theirs. And he, they really tried to simplify the game. And it works, it works. But mm-hmm. yeah, I, I do think that was a turning point in Dunn's game. And that was why he was dropped on yeah. Saturday. Because there was a feeling this guy just doesn't have the confidence. Mm-hmm. And... I don't want to make him too much for scapegoat, but I think when we're looking across the season, we're looking at January, not getting in a streetwise centre-back, getting that transfer wrong is maybe the one that makes mm. the difference in those four or five points mm. that would have took us over the line. Yeah, a, a streetwise centre-back, perhaps you might say an experienced centre-back for want of a, the more simplest term. Do you think, because I, I often think this, do you think that might have possibly, I thought this one to you, Josh, do you think that experienced centre-back, that attribute in the squad... That should have been Glenn Leuven's, but obviously for whatever whatever reason, it's not him. Well, I think that was the plan. Mm-hmm. Um, I think bringing him in was probably there was probably some thinking about the dressing room as well. Yeah, to be sort of an influence um, of someone who's who's been there and done it, if you like. Mm-hmm. Pardon the pun. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, it's obviously, bad. it's uh, <laughs> took us a while. <laughs> it's easy to look back in, in hindsight and say oh, we should have done this differently, but there's probably an argument. And and at the time it made sense because we we recently lost Madger, but there's possibly an argument that in January a centre back should have been just as much of a priority as a striker. Mm-hmm. I because think because even up to then we were struggling to find a centre back pair, and that, in my opinion, ever looked comfortable. Yeah, and I suppose hindsight's a wonderful thing, isn't it? We can look back at the end of the season and say, oh, there, there were points in the season where we should have improved the squad with as a whole. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah it, as just, a whole in the yeah. key, or, or perhaps even just in the key areas, just yeah. to maybe just so these issues that came up late the season could never have come up. But I think it's it's probably unfair to say that the centre backs are the complete Achilles heel of the season because there were points in the season where there were there were very decent. I mean, look, looking back at the season, Jeff, would would you say that perhaps? By December, by January, we were in a position where our centre backs were widely regarded to be sorely lacking in the quality for a team pushing for promotion. No, I think I think it's just always throughout from sort of November time. November, it seemed like the team was was developing into a bit of momentum, and then you thought this is the time when they when they're going to kick on. Um, but I just think they. The, the number of times that they've, they've let Leeds slip. I mean, to be fair, they've also won an awful lot of points from losing positions, so they have got great great spirit and great character. Um, but the number of times that they've let slip points from winning positions and never quite got into that position sort of Christmas time where you thought this is where they're, they're going to steamroller and, 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 you know, and run away with it. And the defence has always been a, a, a concern. I've, mm-hmm. I've felt it through, throughout, well, for most of the season, really. Yeah, I think I they've think been bailed out a lot of times by a having a good a good goalkeeper yeah, which, yeah. and and b by the quality of the of the, the opposition strikers. I mean, mm-hmm. there's there's so we've conceded so much possession and and so many chances this season that in previous years, obviously at Premier League level, but also in the Championship, they would have been punished. But how, so many yeah. times this season, you've 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 thought. Oh, they're going to score it. Well, mm. How did they not? How did they not make the most yeah. of that? Yeah. And the, and the quality of the opposition mm-hmm. strikers has has helped them as well. I think as well the reason the reason I'm probably you know mentioning centre backs more is because I've watched quite a bit of Portsmouth recently. I obviously saw the game yesterday, and then I watched them against Coventry, and I just watch with envy yeah. at Burgess and Clark, mm-hmm. and just that centre back pairing. 
that we haven't had this season, and they just look solid. Yeah, and they just look even because I mean, they went one down at Coventry. I mean, they should have lost that game, if I'm honest. But they come back and won because they just they had that confidence in the back two. I think, um, and we've never had that. I don't think. I think there was just two other points I'd like to make about centre backs. Even sort of when we went on that seven game win streak, it was McLaughlin bailing them out a lot. And even when Flanagan and Baldwin were there as a partnership, I think there was always a sense that they were a bit too similar. Two guys who are decent technically for League One level, but maybe lack a bit of physicality, big time with Flanagan. And I think even when it was there, it was like, we don't necessarily need someone better. We just need someone a bit more streetwise and physical. Mm. So even when, when things were going well, I think that was something that was flagged. And the other thing as well is, I mean, it wasn't really hindsight because December was when we lost to Portsmouth and Glenn Leuvens got sent off. And then you'd, you'd know better than me, Jeff, but Jack Ross was like, yeah, we're getting a centre back in early. We're getting a centre back in early in January. So it was something they'd flagged mm. up. And it didn't happen that early in January, so maybe it wasn't the first target was done. Maybe they struggled a bit to work out how much of the budget to give towards a centre-back. Madger didn't go till mid-January, so maybe that messed things up. But I, yeah, I just get the sense that the club didn't realise how much of a problem position it was until yeah. it was too late. Mm -hmm. I think it was definitely targeted as a spot that could have been improved, but it wouldn't have... I don't think it would have been seen at the time as something that would have been an absolute detriment to the rest of the season. Definitely at that point of the season, people were thinking, right, Baldwin and Flanagan are your starting back pair. And they're, they're quite good, but neither of those lads are very physical. You know, they're, they're, both, they're both tall lads, especially Flanagan, but they're both quite skinny and they're both getting pushed around by sort of big, burly strikers. I mean, if, you, when you look at someone like Kiefer Miller, would just chuck them about like a dog toy. The, 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 the issue there was, was quite profound. And I think... I think to, to a lot of people, Jack Ross would have ticked a box by selling Jimmy Dunn because he's a very big, burly lad as well. But then I think you might say, looking back now, Jimmy Dunn was quite insufficient because as, as you said there, as you said there, Jimmy, well, yeah, as you said there, Jimmy, as in Jimmy across from me, not Jimmy Dunn. <laughs> that's going to confuse me now. We'll call him Dunn and we'll call you Jimmy, right? Oh, there we go. That's, that's sorted. Yeah, so... Basically, as you said there, Jimmy, with regards to Dunn, see, there we go, lo lo lovely and clear. The system works. It's smooth. Yeah, yeah, exactly. A, a, a perfect segue into that. As we said, you know, Jack Ross didn't sign someone that was streetwise. He signed someone that was big and burly. And in a lot of games, he did make a difference. We, we were a lot more of an aerial threat in the corners, because if, if you remember rightly, corners, we, we just couldn't score from mm. at that point in the season. Mm. And he did a relatively decent job of holding off maybe the, le the less sort of clinical but burly forwards in this division but then uh, as we say he lacks the experience he lacks the confidence and in the big games when we're not doing too well that shows in games like at home Accrington in front of the sky cameras yeah. playing against mm. you know, well, you know, the, the, there are there are, sadly there are uh, there are too many examples for it to not be a pretty big issue but I suppose I suppose that that's just where we are on a more positive note with regards to the Peterborough game was there anyone, Jimmy, who you thought had a particularly good game? I remember Lewis Morgan wasn't as good at Doncaster, but he was quite good again. Mm -hmm. um, Max Power, I thought, was easily man of the match. Even before his goal, I thought, in that game, he did a really good job of playing with energy, of getting up and down the pitch, of, of just sort of trying to make things happen. Um, it's It just seems like an age ago. It was only six days ago, and it feels like <laughs> an age ago. Yeah. But I think Power was the one I signalled out. Yeah, centre-backs were a bit up and down. Um yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd signal out Morgan. McGeady looks okay, but the lad couldn't run in the game. No. Um, yeah, I, th I think think Power would really be the one and the continued form of Morgan, really, from, mm -hmm. those, from that game. I think with Morgan, Morgan, for me, has played very well in the past few games, but one thing that tends just to maybe just irk me a little bit about him, while I do think he has some very good spells, after about the 30-minute mark, he does start to fade. Yeah. Have you noticed that, Josh, at all? L yeah. The exact same thing, yeah. yeah. I've noticed that, definitely. Mm -hmm. I don't know why at all, but I think what he is good at, and I think, you know, at the moment, he is probably one of our best players. He just gets us up the pitch yeah. when we need him to. I'm not sure he's finished a game yet, has he? Has he, no, has he played a whole, no. a whole 90 minutes yet? He's, uh, uh, I think he's often hooped not. around the 60, 70 minute mark, possibly for that reason that he does tend to fade. But he did come here very much short of shorter games as well. Oh, absolutely. Which I think it, for various key players like Charlie White and like Will Grigg, that's that's affected them as well. Mm -hmm. um, and and McGeoch as well, you know, being being out for so much. Of the, so guys who who I think it's it's hard if you're not in the game to know how much how much it 
pre-season counts. But um, Lee Clark, who obviously does does a slot with us on a Monday and you know, manages at those levels as well, and he was saying, as a player, if you miss pre-season or miss a chunk of the start of the season, it is so difficult to catch up. And it's, it's sort of sometimes... February, March, April before you get into a season mm. and I think that's handicapped them as well um, mm-hmm. How big do you think that's been for Ozturk perhaps? In light of that is it perhaps a very big reason why a lot of people were concerned about him jumping back into the team? Oh definitely well, having seen him early on in the season you oh, thought well, yeah. what? <laughs> so mm-hmm. I was thinking probably not going to see him again No um, my, my last abiding memory of Ozturk was when he just sort of like uh, I don't know like sort of sort of pirouetted around um, Forestier area in the in the, in the Sheffield, Sheffield Wednesday Cup yeah. game, yeah, <laughs> that bizarre sort of goal that we let in. But, but I mean, I think really that the Sunderland side that we've seen since the Coventry game has been quite a radically different one, both in both in formation and in I think the in the, in the philosophy and, and the the approach to the games themselves. But we'll stick with you with this one, Jeff. Who for you has really stepped up in the last few games? I know the results haven't gone the way we've ideally wanted them to, but who do you think's really sort of like stepped up to the plate in light of that absolute drubbing that Coventry gave us? Uh, 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 I think. I mean, on Luke O'Neill never hides, no. which uh, which I really admire him for because I think Coventry was probably the first game where you thought this lad's not a natural right back and it's not playing in his position, but he's he's stuck at it, um, and I just think he's got a great attitude. Um, McGeady is still, you know, is, is doing the sort of things that you were hoping he was going to be doing last season. And um, <laughs> yeah, is there anyone in particular who's who's really stood out? Max Power, um, but I, I just worry that the, after that Coventry game, the loss of momentum mm-hmm. and loss of confidence. It seems like all the other teams, well, maybe not all the other teams, with the exception of Doncaster, but the likes of Barnsley, Portsmouth, and Charlton, they're all hitting form. They're all they've yeah. all they're all on a run. Sunderland are, are, are coming towards the end of the season and almost you know flagging and mm. looking for the uh, the finishing line. Yeah, I think we're starting to possibly see a, a drop in stamina. But how much of is it, how much of it is a concern, Josh? That we that perhaps of of the three teams there that Jeff's just named, mm-hmm. two of those will go into the playoff finals as it stands on a very rich vein of form. I mean, Portsmouth don't stop winning with the draw they've got against us. Charlton are still looking very good. Yeah. And of course, Barnsley won't want to slip up. But we're going into this on the back of three draws and a loss. You know, we're not we're not doing too great. Yeah, but uh, again, I think you've come to the optimist in the room. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> um, I, I think we were, better, we were easily the better side yesterday. Mm-hmm. So that, if anything, I came out of that thinking, oh, I think we could, I think we could do Portsmouth. Yeah. I think we could have them. Charlton, if anything, I'm probably more worried about at the moment. They seem to be just going under the, doing their business under the radar, and all of a sudden they're what two points behind us, something like that. I don't think Barnsley will drop points, so I think they'll be fine. I mean, they've um, got some very, they've got some very crucial players back in the squad. You know, big they do, and just the character. One. I mean, if they were going to drop points, it was yesterday against Blackpool, and the fact they went behind and then still won, that tells me they've got a bit about them. And I, I think they'll, I think they'll beat Bristol Rovers comfortably. Yeah. If I'm honest, I don't see Bristol Rovers offering any because they've got nothing to play for. I don't see them offering any, anything particularly tricky. Mm. So I don't know. I, I, I still think we could, we could win the playoffs. Yeah. It's interesting what you say there, though, about having nothing to play for. I mean, I don't know off the top of my head where Bristol Rovers are in the league, but I think what is fortunate at this stage of the season is that because the relegation battle is just so sort of massive in League One, that there are going to be a lot of teams that have something to play for. And I often find, I mean, it's it's ridiculous, isn't it? There's about 13 teams who are like fighting to not finish like 21st or w- w- whatever the w- whatever the cutoff point is for relegation in this division. But I think what you find is, is that if a team has nothing to play for, like say Coventry did when we played them, they can play with a lot more freedom and a, and a lot less pressure. And obviously with a team like us who are, who are sort of really under the cost to get results, I think the, the the tension's a lot more palpable for us and it's just totally off their shoulders for them. So they can play with more expression and I think just a more confidence knowing there's nothing to lose. And that is perhaps where I'm getting a bit concerned about Fleetwood, Jimmy. Do you think that Joey Barton knows, or well he will know, that obviously his team are 12th in the league, they've got nowhere to go, but he would absolutely love to stop us going up? Oh, this is it for him. I mean, we, we don't know what's going to happen with the... Barnsley situation and the accusations there. So <laughs> oh. if this is his one and only season in management, what better way to go out than stick him on over on Sunderland? I mean, he's been 
very openly critical about Jack Ross in the media. He completely played the big un and, and sort of trolled us in the lead up to the first game about how we're not a bigger team than Coventry. I mean, he will be loving this. I mean, this is, yeah, he's, he's got nothing else to get out of this season mm. other than pissing off Sunderland fans. So, Oh, it'll be the, it'll be the yeah. climax of the Joy Barton documentary, won't it? <laughs> <laughs> Which is, mm-hmm. I mean, I, I say that, I said that in my head as a joke, but then when when the words came out, I was like, actually, no, that's that's correct. That's well, he's what, already that's had what an audio book, hasn't he? Oh yeah, someone had for that the other day. <laughs> well, he's got an audio book. Yeah, yeah. Does he narrate it himself? Yeah, of course he does. Crikey! It's <laughs> God, it's like Chinese water torture, that isn't it? Listen to that. <laughs> but anyway, let's uh, steer away. We're, we're going to get more into the um, uh, the previewing the the remaining games of the season and thinking ahead prediction wise to how those will go. But before that, let's move on now to the Portsmouth game, which I suppose is perhaps the main event, if you want to call it that, of what we'll talk about today. So we'll start with you, Jeff. What did you make of that game yesterday? Just all in all, how did you feel about it? What were you expecting? And how did you see the game itself as it unfolded? Uh, great atmosphere to start with. Um, 41,000 was was astonishing, really. Oh, it's astronomical. Um, it just shows that you give people a little bit of a taste of it and, they'll, uh, and they will come back. I mean, there were times last season where uh, walking to the game, it was heartbreaking to see how empty the uh, the place looked and 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 thinking back to what it had been like in premier league days and at times like that you think this ground will never be full again uh, so you know, in one respect it's great you know it's great that the fans are coming back and um football's not been great this season but it's been decent and there have been some positive results and and yesterday i think as i said earlier it was like a microcosm of the season they you know, started well um it gave away a bit of a sloppy equaliser with a ball pinging around the box and you thought that should have really been cleared um, and then had the chances to win it. Um, I came up against a, a goalkeeper on top form and and then right at the end, I think it was Maguire, wasn't it? You, you just thought, why, why didn't he just put his foot through that ball mm-hmm. instead of trying to control it and, and pass it on? Uh, obviously on his, not on his favourite foot, but... Um, yeah, and ultimately, it came away feeling a little bit well disappointed that that the season had sort of slipped away and automatic promotion is well, it's just about out of reach now, isn't it? With, oh, it's uh, absolutely goal goal difference to uh, to make up. Yeah, um, would it be the end of the world if Sunderland aren't promoted this season? Not really. I mean, it'd be disappointing, um, but I think part of me worries that. If they are promoted, that team would not be anywhere near good enough for the championship. Mm-hmm. Is there enough money to to improve it? If they go down for another season, would that give Jack Ross the, the chance to sort of you know because he came in quite late, started very late in the when was it, it was like June, wasn't it when he uh, when he came in with a bit more time? Would it be a? I know I know it's almost heresy to say mm. would you want another season in in, in League One, but. I agree, though. I agree. I, I don't think his summer window, I mean, that summer window was an, an anomaly, to say the least. January is always a hard window. So really, he hasn't had, I don't really think he's had a full window to get the squad he wants. So I think, like you say, I, I also agree that if we went up now, we'd need a lot of investment. Mm, an awful lot. Um, I think we'd really struggle. I mean, if, if we went up now with the squad we have, unless we had a lot of investment, it would be stay, just stay up. That would be the that would be the plan. Obviously, it's best to go up this season because I think it's just that that mental thing of two seasons in League One. It just it's like oh, you're yeah. a League One club now. Oh, <laughs> it's a bit of a slog. The novelty's kind of wore off at this yeah. point. Yeah. Going back to Accrington and but and places looking like that. at the bigger picture, is going up as hopefully champions next season. Is that more of a positive? Mm-hmm. And yes, it it took a bit longer, but we went. You know, if we went up with champions, we would go up as champions. Hopefully, we've run away with it almost, and then we can go up with a bit of confidence, and we can go up with, you know, what we don't need as much investment mm. to, into the championship. We're almost ready to mm-hmm. go up because you can rush things in football, and maybe I don't want to say, it, but maybe it will be too <laughs> soon. I think there's definitely an element of that concern. I think whichever way you look at it, it's possible to be pessimistic. Which whichever sort of whichever side of the events unfolding you look at. Um, let's say we go with with option A, and we we are good enough to get promoted one way or another. I think there's a definite concern that without the right investment, you know, we've got the third best team in League One going into the championship, and then 
you know, the the golfing quality is massive. If you look at the teams at the top end of the championship mm-hmm. compared to the teams at the top end of League One, it's absolutely huge. I wouldn't. I mean, if I wouldn't want us to play a team like Aston Villa or Leeds or Norwich in a million years, not with not with the team we've got now, mm-hmm. absolutely not. But then equally, as 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 you say there, Josh, if you stay in League One another season, you know, you're in League One another season. It's just. It's, uh, it's more it's, than just a one-off when you're there. It is, yeah. Season, I mean, it's. It? I mean, let, let's let's be honest. It's a pretty crap league. You know, the the, the officials are terrible. The, the the quality is just not non-existent at times. The time wasting is the, is probably the one thing oh, that's annoyed yeah, me yeah. more than anything this season. You've got to play yeah, Gareth Ains with Wickham. Yeah. <laughs> Joey Barton might be there as well. God, it's just, it's just minging. Don't want to don't want to be there anymore. I'll be honest, though, I've enjoyed it. Yeah, I mean, I have. But I, I just, I just wonder, will we enjoy it as much if we have to sort of slog through the games that aren't quite as glamorous? Because you know, if if we look back at the season with nostalgia in a few years' time, I'm sure we'll recall all the 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 the, the good, like the the, the bantery times we've had. But you know, a lot of those games have been pretty dire. You know, there was the one one away at Wickham, the one one away at Oxford, the wh- whichever one one else. You know, like pretty much, pretty much any one one has been crap. Yeah. That's that's kind of how it's gone, really. Yeah, I just, I don't want to be here again. But speaking of games in League One that aren't quite as dire, we'll we'll just sort of I'll sort of like railroad us back into the Portsmouth game real quick because this is a point that I definitely wanted to bring up. Portsmouth definitely had something of a psychological advantage, having beaten us twice this season. With you know one of those wins being in a cup final at Wembley, albeit the checker trade, it's still a cup final in the the most iconic stadium in England. But did that apparent advantage, Jimmy, look like it had any bearing on the game yesterday? Maybe, maybe. This is the main thing that I've sort of been wrestling with in my head since the game is that last 20 minutes, knowing we're guaranteed to be in the playoffs, why didn't we throw the kitchen sink at them? Why didn't we try more? How important was it for us to not lose against Portsmouth? And that's sort of what I've been wondering because Jack Ross has been really proactive in games we're drawing. He's took risks in games where we've been drawing to try and get the win. And to an extent he did yesterday. He went 4-4-2 when they were still 4-5-1. He did switch it up. But I kind of thought there was an extra level of effort. There was an extra level of desperation that we never saw. And that was the big disappointment with me. And I'm wondering whether not being in the dressing room after Wembley, not being in the dressing room yesterday, I'm underestimating how important it was for us to not lose to Pompey because the difference between getting that second goal tomorrow and not is huge. And I and the difference between them going at the other end and not and scoring again in the grand scheme of things, looking at the playoffs and our position, it wasn't that important. So I'm a bit surprised that we didn't go for it more. But I'm wondering if that's the sort of FIFA football manager players mentality. <laughs> yeah. And in the real world, things are different. But that's, mm-hmm. yeah, that's, that's something that I don't really have the answer mm-hmm. for. And I'd be interested to hear the other guys, whether they think that Jack Ross was right to maybe not go for it, whether the players were right to protect what they had or... Did you think that we didn't go for it? Because looking at that second half, yeah. I, I if, if the term I would have used was that they did, I thought they did throw the kitchen sink in the second half. I thought I we had that, them on the ropes mm, for a good good 10 minutes. Absolutely. Um, but like you say, their keeper was was on form and he just had a presence about him. So, I, I, I mean, I was right behind the goal at the Roker end. Um and he just filled he just filled the goal. He really did. Like he just walked with a strut. Um and it's again, it's probably when you have a, a strong defence in front of you and all that stuff, I think there's, there's that confidence that you build together. Um but we just yeah, I I I, I think we, we had them on the ropes for a yeah. good while. I mean, full credit to Portsmouth. The defensively they were resolute. Uh, Craig McGillivray, we haven't really spoken in any depth about him, but and I don't normally say this about uh, any opposition team, let alone a fellow League One opposition team. But what a performance he had! Mm. That was absolutely unreal. Some of the saves he made. Saving the first half was the mm. best. Oh, I think. Bloody hell! Yeah, mm, I mean, yeah. a lot of people oh, sitting around me didn't realise that McGillivray tipped Morgan's overhead kick onto the post. Oh, I mean, what yeah. a goal that would have been, yeah. and what a save to keep it out. That was it. Had, it had shades of Craig Gordon keeping out that night. It was, <laughs> it was unreal. How? how what, what did you make of him, Jeff? Yeah, well, as you say, it was inspired as one of those games, wasn't it? Maybe the occasion lifted him. I mean, uh, so many fans in the ground, so many Portsmouth fans there making a bit of noise. Um, I think they they will be looking at it thinking there's three games, three times we've played Sunderland this season, um, haven't lost, you know, effectively two draws and a um, and a win. And I think they will, they will if, if the teams meet again at Wembley, they will have uh, some sort of advantage. They will have that psychological uh, 
edge. So, yeah. sorry, Jeff, who do you think comes out of this game, this game yesterday, with the sort of psychological upper hand, if you want to call it that? I think Portsmouth will. Right. Yeah, having having you know three times played Sunderland this season and mm-hmm. and not lost, um, the, and and with it being back at Wembley, if it if if it come, <laughs> if both teams get that far, mm-hmm. yeah, um, I, I would be very concerned about playing Charlton in the. Uh, uh, which well, looks like the one that yeah. it's, that it's going to be. Hmm. Um, you know, that first game of the season, you, know, you, you can't really read an awful lot into, into that because there was so much hype around it and mm-hmm. um, fantastic end to the game. But um, it feels like so long ago now. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? Yes, a lifetime ago. Different, it feels different like two era. different squads and <laughs> clubs entirely since then. That's it's, it's bizarre to think that's even that's even the same season. You know, I mean, yeah. obviously it's always the case, but so much has happened since then. Naturally, it's. It's uh, it, it's quite interesting. I mean, to be honest, Jeff. I mean, I, again, just 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 to be contrary, and I'm going to have to disagree. I think coming out of that game, the, the sort of the the psych, the, sort of the, the the mental edge might be might be the ball might be in Sunderland's court coming away from that. We did draw, you know. Obviously, once again, it's another one-one for Sunderland. Mm. But if you look at the first half, Portsmouth had one spell where they looked pretty good just after scoring, but then they sort of faded back out, and in the second half, it was all of us. And they, they didn't really have a shot. They, they didn't have a sniff no, in the second half, no. and we we were just all over them. If 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 it wasn't for McGillivray's sort of standout performance, I think even you, Jimmy, might have given him ten out of ten. <laughs> there, I say. Yeah, yes, best goalkeeping performance yeah. we've seen by yeah. country man yeah. this season. So probably a seven for you than Jimmy, yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Fair enough. Yeah. Well, I think yeah. It, it, had he have been just a bog standard League One keeper, I think it could have won that three or four one. Mm-hmm. To be honest yeah. with you, because of all, all it was, we played I think very well and. It took a very good keeper to keep out, say, obviously Morgan's overhead kick, uh, Charlie Wyke's shot at the end of the first half, and then uh, sort of Max Power's snapshot. I think it was Max Power who got fed yes. in by Maguire. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. So then you know there's there's just a, a handful of a handful of goals that could have gone in, and there were a few more as well. I mean Morgan had a good shot from outside the box in the second half. There were just a lot of opportunities that um, uh, that uh, a lesser keeper wouldn't have got. You know, mm-hmm. if if you have you've, you've got you've got Lee Camp in stick that in sticks there, and it's it's, it's five <laughs> or six, mm-hmm. but. It just shows how much of a difference he made. I don't know what you think, Jimmy. Who do you think comes out of this game? I I think half and half. I right. I, I definitely think if you're Jack Ross, it's not a hard sell to say, look, we've played him three times. Take out the Glenn Leuven's red card. Take out extra time when we're knackered. We're pretty even. Mm-hmm. So we, we just need to put things right. If I we're agree. at our top level, we can beat them. Mm-hmm. So I think, I think it's an easy sell for both managers. It's easy for Kenny Jacket to be. We've not lost to these. Last time we were here, they were collapsed in the centre circle at Wembley. Execute and we can beat them. So I think I think both managers can G up their players and it's just a case who performs on the day. I think mm-hmm. we're two very evenly matched teams. Charlton's interesting because they they were good against us at the Valley, but Carlon Grant was still there and he's at Huddersfield now. Mm-hmm. Johnny Williams has been integrated into the team <laughs> since then. Arebo, who's a big player for them. Was was injured in that game in January as well, but then we wouldn't have had Ledbetter mm-hmm. playing. We didn't have Morgan playing. So yeah, it's it's really hard to get a sense of which team's better based off the two meetings. I think it really is. I think it really is. It's um every time I think if we were to play Charlton again in the playoffs in any whether that be the semi or the final, we've played Charlton when they've been three entirely different teams because they've changed quite a lot over the course of the season. But I think it's probably goes without saying now. And I'll go to you, Josh. Just how crucial is it to finish third rather than fourth, with the playoff semis in mind? Bearing in mind, of course, that fourth that fourth place would play fifth in the semis, yeah. and third would play sixth. It's it's preferred, but I also have that thing of, you know, you have to play. You're gonna to have to play fourth or fifth anyway, even if you beat sixth. So I almost think if you're gonna if you're gonna win the playoffs, you just have to beat whoever's in front of you. And it's almost. I mean, the playoffs is a bit of a lottery. It's just whoever performs best. So if we finish fourth and play against Charlton, then we have to beat Charlton. If we if we finish third and play against Doncaster, then we have to beat Doncaster. And then if we get through and have to play Portsmouth or Charlton, we still have to beat them mm-hmm. to go to to go up. So I'm not too worried about that. I'm not looking at these last two games thinking, right, let's get third. Obviously, we want to win them. We want to get that momentum. And I think to touch on what we were talking about earlier, I think not losing yesterday was probably massively important if we ever if we come up against Portsmouth again. Yeah. Are you of a similar mind, Jeff? 
Um, I don't know. I, I would Doncaster is obviously the uh, the preferred option. The other teams, as, as we say, are on just on such a good, you know, pulse for eight eight wins in was it seven in a row, wasn't it? Before Saturday, Charlton yeah. won eight out the last ten. Before they played the mighty one one merchants. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and I'd, I'd would just be a shame for the season to end in a an anti climax of a of a playoff semi final defeat and not even. Uh, um, I mean, it's a funny sort of season, isn't it? Mm. Given the low mark from where the club was this time last year and or from, from the summer before Jack Ross uh, came in, to be challenging, to, to have had a Wembley final and be challenging for promotion still, even though it might have to be through the playoffs, is, is some achievement. And yet, statistically, it it is it will be the, the lowest finishing p- position in the club's entire history, mm-hmm. only lost three games. I'm guessing. I mean, in my lifetime, I can't remember some some team only losing three mm. games all all season. And yet, there's just that. I think everyone's is sort of not quite sure whether they've enjoyed this season or not. Really, I've definitely really enjoyed it. Oh yeah. But there's yeah. There's there's question marks about how good the team is. There's there's been definite low points and high points, but. I think the novelty factor and just a chance to see Sunderland win again <laughs> outweighs the naffness of some of the grounds we've gone to and some of the teams that have yeah been chanting all sorts at us. But I think on a whole, we, we did need that after sort of the six years in the Premier League and the mm-hmm. less than 40 points. I do think on a whole, we'll look back on it positively. It's just obviously if it doesn't end with promotion, mm. it's log off of Twitter, it's it's get away from the bad takes and then <laughs> regroup in August. That's and if it is Charlton, you, you just know that Mickey, even if it's in the semi-finals, you know, Mickey Gray's penalty is going to be weird. Oh, out, yeah. Weird yeah. out again yeah. and there's all and and there will be a lot of bad vibes around. And people yeah, I mean, it, it's, even, a, it's a sports tabloid's dream, isn't it? Oh, Ch- Sunderland and Charlton are back in the playoffs. Remember mm. when you lost and it was awful. You know? <laughs> that, that's it, isn't it? It's, uh, yeah. it's an element of that. I would argue, though, that, it's, um, that we should... I mean, obviously, I know Josh. You you're very happy just to beat the team that's put in front of of your side. You're happy just to to play who you've got because, as you say, it's a very valid point. You're playing them regardless. You're playing fourth or fifth, regardless if you play sixth and beat them first of all. Mm-hmm. But I think it would be good because we've touched on this earlier. I know Jimmy brought up momentum. Momentum's crucial. It's what we don't have, mm-hmm. and it's what the teams around us do have. And it could be a massive factor going into these last games. Yeah. If we say if we beat Fleetwood, which is great, and then if we beat Southend, which is great again. We could have third place, which you know I think is fantastic because then you've got Doncaster and yeah. Doncaster are pretty naff. I, I know we both times we've played them, we've outplayed them. When we, when we played them here, they were second best in every aspect. It, it was it was a comfortable win. It was just a, a joy to watch. I think if you go into the final therefore on the back of three straight wins, then chances are the lads will be up for it. Say you go into it and you've just scraped past Charlton, you didn't look particularly convincing, and now you've got Portsmouth then I think that could be where the psychology comes into play. I think for me, it's it's pretty big to to get Doncaster. But I think that's I think that's what it is. But I think what we want is, I think there will be, there will be sort of negative aspects of the team. There will be weak points that will be prevalent regardless because the team isn't perfect, but we don't want those highlighted against Charlton before you play Portsmouth. I just think you want to give the lads a good run out beating Doncaster and then take on a better team. I just mm-hmm. think that's how it'll go. Some exchange betting companies run short-lived promotions, like months-long offers of low commission. At BetDAC, we wanted to change the way we did things, so we set our commission at 2% permanently. That's 2% on football, horse racing, golf, almost any sport. 2%. That's just one way that BetDAC is changing for the better. For the better, like you. Backdark, the 2% commission exchange. Over 18s only, please gamble responsibly. On a similar note as well, speaking about weak points, looking back at the last two last two games, Portsmouth and Peterborough, we'll go to you, Jeff. I was about to say you in the middle, but that makes no sense because it's an audio-based <laughs> platform. But yeah, <coughs> was there anyone that you didn't think played particularly well in the past few games? Um, I didn't see all the, the Peterborough game. I just saw the highlights of that one because I was actually at... Uh, I was watching South Shields versus Scarborough. Oh, wonderful! Mm-hmm. And, uh, and it was a late winner in that one. It was, yes, yes. Injury time. Uh, I wish we could get those. <laughs> <laughs> injury time with the keeper at the other end of the pitch, uh, and uh, uh, Daly, I think it was, who ran it ran from halfway 
followed by the goalie. Mm. It, was a, it, was a, it was a great comedy winner, um, but very good goal. Um, that's no one that really, certainly from, from the Portsmouth game, no one who we thought had an absolute stinker. No, no, not, not uh, say Peterborough game I didn't see. So, uh, right. Catamol looked a bit leggy, I thought. At Peterborough, I sort of got the impression that he was playing on fumes a bit. The, the only other thing I'd say was that there was sort of a weak, there were weak points in our team that could be got at in the Peterborough game because of the lack of confidence in our centre halves. And then also when Peterborough had the ball at the back, we couldn't press them because White's slow and McGeady's playing through the pain factor. Mm. So there was a couple weak areas and a couple sort of aspects of our game that they were able to take advantage of. But in terms of individuals, now there wasn't really any. Any th- stinkers that stick out for me, anyway. I thought Oviedo was poor yesterday. Did you? Yeah. yeah, yeah, he gave away the ball a lot. Yeah. And yeah. He, he actually, going back to Peterborough, he was lucky not to get sent off mm. because he got the book oh, in the right. first half that was harsh, but then obviously he's dived in on Madison. Mm. Madison's jumped over him theatrically, and I'd argue that it wasn't a second yellow. But when you dive in like that, you give the referee an option. Mm. Crazily, he got booked for diving. I don't think it was a dive either. When you're jumping out the way of someone who's trying to take you out, I don't think that's a dive. No. But, but yeah, so I mean, I don't know, because I think on the whole, he, he has brought something because he's so good at carrying the ball and he's so good technically. Mm. And McGeady draws so much attention. There is space at left back for him or Hume to expose that Reese James just doesn't have the technical talent. Mm-hmm to do so I mean he has been up and down but I'm not sure that's necessarily a, con- a persistent weakness that will come up in the playoffs yeah. I think yeah I think there's definitely well on the side as a whole in the past two games I think you would say that collectively they played pretty well but there are weak spots I think definitely persisting there and interestingly about Aidan McGeady as we've said he's as, as we've said and as it's been pointed out by Jack Ross he's playing through the pain you know he's got I can't imagine he's got like a cocktail of painkillers keeping him through with that broken foot. Mm-hmm. It, you know, if you put yourself in his shoes, which you wouldn't want to, given <laughs> how one of the what one of the what one of the feet's going to look like at the moment, but every sort of like step he's taken on a mazy run is probably causing him a lot of, a lot of anguish there. Yeah. And when you're sort of coordinating, you know, his skills with that pain, I'd imagine it's a pretty big task for him to even play right now. Would we rest him for the last two games? Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I agree. Mm-hmm. I agree. Um, and just hope that. He's ready for the playoffs. Mm-hmm. I think that's how we have to look at it now. He's almost a luxury, which we don't need to uh, we don't need to use in the last two games. No. Do you think, think we have enough on the wings to see off Fleetwood and Southend? I think we do. And the other thing as well is, will the real Lyndon Gooch stand up? It's two oh. games for oh. Gooch coming back from his hamstring injury to find some form of form, yeah. to work out his game, to work out when to take people on, when to play it mm-hmm. simple. Maybe, just maybe, if he scores another goal, that gives mm-hmm. him a lift and that gives mm-hmm. us an option off the bench. And we've got Maguire back. Playoffs. Yeah, that's I think yes. Maguire that's can yeah. play out left because McGeady comes inside a lot anyway. So I think, you know, they probably fit quite similar roles mm-hmm. um, with the over, overlap and left back. So I think that's, that gives us another option. Yeah. And I think we need to get Maguire playing because we need to get him match fit again for the playoffs as well. Again, with momentum, I think you want Maguire in a good vein of form, yeah. beating teams yeah. prior to yeah. taking on teams that are a lot more meaningful. Because mm. part of me thinks yesterday, you know, the chance that he had where he tried to pass it, a confident Maguire, a match fit Maguire would would have probably just shot. Mm. So maybe because he's just got mm. just just came back, you know, he's he's maybe not as confident as we've seen him. Yeah, because we know he can stick it in from twenty five yards. We've seen, um, and that was you know. Probably about ten yards or something. They look like so. Yeah, I think we, if we if we can rest McGeady and get Maguire in, that would be my suggestion. Yeah, I think there's. I think that's as it stands our best option. Mm. Um, I'm starting to lose a lot of faith in Lyndon Gooch. I yeah. want. I really, really want it to be a bad run of form, but it's a bad run of form that's lasted half a season now. And I, I'm, I'm watching him play, and it's there's just a when I see him move, I, I don't really see like a, a winger. With the intelligence of Aidan McGeady or or Morgan or Maguire, I just see someone who's fast and who can put his head down and run, but but we don't see much beyond that. I, I just mm-hmm. I, I see a lad who just sort of like takes the ball and goes to the byline, and then once he realizes that he's going to get closed down, he just plays a sideways pass back to one nine, yeah. and then the the movement's lost. Either that or he'll just crash on the advertising boards. It, it doesn't really seem like much <laughs> happens with Gooch, and I don't want that to be the case. But that's just that's just what I'm seeing. So just one final point before we move on to our next part. 
with the Portsmouth game, we are unfortunately going to end on a sour note, and it's just something I want to bring up fairly briefly. But let's talk about the incident with the flare. Mm. because it's something that highlights maybe a recurring issue because this was the case against Coventry. Mm-hmm. There's been twice now where missiles have been thrown from the the, 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 upper, the upper concourse and it, it struck fans, you know, many of which are families below. Yeah. You know, first it's just coins and, and, and bottles and which is allegedly full of urine in, in the in the Coventry case. But yesterday it was a it was a it was a pyrotechnic, it was a flare. Do we need to move the away fans? Uh, yes, unfortunately, I think so. I also question how you get a pyrotechnic in the stadium. Um, that's a concern. Mm. It's, I mean, it's a tough one because it should. I mean, the, it was funny. I remember the, the message came up, um, and I'm paraphrasing because I can't remember exactly what it said. But it was some, something along the lines of, can fans please refrain from throwing missiles at each other? And I just <laughs> remember thinking there should be no need for that kind of message. No. In a stadium predominantly full of adults. And it really baffles me. It's it, what that message was essentially saying was, "Can we stop throwing things at each other, please, mm-hmm. everyone? Mm-hmm. <laughs> please don't <laughs> bomb in the pool." Just, yeah. uh, it's just, it's just crazy. And yes, I think unfortunately, you, the only way you can kind of fix it or take away the the problem entirely is to move them. But I don't know where you move them to. Yeah, no. I think it's um, it, it, it unfortunately foregrounds quite a few problems. I think, as you say, you know, we shouldn't be having how we shouldn't be having pyros in the ground at all. You know that, that that people who bring them in should be vetted beforehand, and should yeah. have those confiscated, mm-hmm. and then secondly, of course, it, it's a shame that you have to move the away fans just because they're throwing stuff. When you know the the the, the sensible option would be for them to not it's do. It's the minority that. as well. It's a stupid it minority, uh, it was, as it always is. But when, when you get big away followings, you know it's it's law of averages. You're going to yeah. get daft people doing that stuff, but. Just something I think possibly to consider. I don't know if you've got any thoughts on the matter, Jimmy. The only thing I'd add is we've talked a lot this season about atmosphere, how to improve it, how to sort of get stadium of like loud again. That's something that could help. If you've got the away fans there and you can mm. look directly at them, maybe that's something that will really get the home support going. You get a bit of banter flying back and forward. So that might be one positive to come out of a bad situation mm-hmm. is maybe that's another thing that can reinforce sort of the improved atmosphere we've seen in recent yeah. weeks. It's a tricky one, isn't it? Because it, 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 the worry was that it would give an advantage. As you remember the Everton Cup tie from a few years ago, the Martin O'Neill days, where they, mm. get, they took the entire bottom section oh, of the South Stand, and, and, and it was like it was like a home game for them. So you stick fans up in the up in the the top tier, and and the atmosphere is lost. Yeah. Um, so I'd, I would like to see the fans back down. I, mean, I know plenty of Sunderland fans who complained. For years about the awful view at St James's Park, and yeah. then uh, <laughs> and then sort of turned a blind eye when the away fans got stuck at the uh, at the top of the stadium. Um, but yeah, where do you put them now? Obviously, you can't go back in the South Stand now that mm. it's the Roker yeah. End and it's all been rebranded. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean the North Stands, I think, fairly renowned as being one of the quietest stands. The yeah. northeast corner, maybe give them one of them corners. Yeah, give them a the northeast corner. Yeah, I'll say. Yeah, I'll be that. That would be my suggestion. You know, just give them a. Give them, a, give them a chunk of that. Yeah. I don't think. I mean, I'm, I'm an I'm an East Stander who's close to the northeast corner, and mm-hmm. it's not an awful lot of noise there. Mm-hmm. You can stick them there. But is that what you want, though? Do you want them next to the quieter stands, or do you want them next to, you know, the Roker end, where you like you say you can have that banter? <laughs> I don't know. I, I I don't know. It's a tough one. It is. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm not really. I've not really thought about it in that much detail, but I just, I just I'd put them somewhere in the lower bowl just so it can generate mm-hmm. a bit mm-hmm. more because. You know, while I don't want us to depend on away fans for atmosphere, I think it, they would mix well with our home fans, which perhaps will be a reason to have them near the south stand, you know, because you could, you know, perhaps having those two together would just generate more noise in general. But I suppose it's it, it's all ifs and buts. But anyway, I think we'll leave, we'll leave that part there. What I want to do now, just for the next 10, 15, 20 minutes or so, is I just want us to evaluate how we think Jack Ross has done this season. What we're going to do is talk a bit about Jack Ross, and then I'm going to go around and rather than give you guys ask for a rating, sorry Jimmy, rather than ask for um, a rating out of ten, um, I want I want us to playoffs notwithstanding, maybe just grade how well you think he's done this season. So you know, a if he's good, b if he's okay. done all right, okay. you know, so on and so mm-hmm. forth. So first of all, I, I again um, the other day because I, I, I love a good Twitter poll. I ran one just yesterday out of interest, and I thought I'll use it again because why not. I just asked on Twitter how well people honestly think Jack Ross has carried out his job this season. The options were he's overachieved, he's done all right, he's underachieved, or he's been terrible. And the results were 10% thought he's overachieved, 
66% thought he's done all right, 22% thought he's underachieved, and 3% think he's been terrible. So the, the general consensus is that, all things considered, Jack Ross has done an all right job. But I suppose we'll go around the table and we'll start with you, Jimmy. Everything considered, what do you make of the job Jack Ross has done for Sunderland? Um, in terms of the grade, I'm torn between a B- minus and a C+. Plus. Mm. Um, a lot to like about him. Every time he talks, he talks with sense. I get the impression he's someone that modern footballers want to play for. He talks a lot about how he likes his public speaking. And yeah, I get the impression he's a real cool customer with his economics degree who, who really sort of understands how to get through to a modern footballer. In terms of negatives, I think we've never really seen an identity under him. It's hard to sort of pinpoint how he plays. But then at the same time, I don't know how much that's his fault. Um, first half of the season, your two best players, Aidan McGeady and Josh Madger, the pressing style he was trying to implement in August, he moved away from because those two players didn't suit it. So is that good management or bad management because he can't get his ideas across? I guess it sort of depends on the eye of the beholder. Um, what concerned me was how he got worse. The more the more he sort of spent time with the team, how he got worse across December and January, it's like... We all expected a tough start. We probably overachieved through the first 12 games. What concerned me is the next 12 games were worse than the first 12 games. And I kind of thought, wait a minute, if this guy's good, I'd expect us to start getting better. Mm -hmm. But then we did rebound in January. And generally, we've been playing good football pretty much since February. Ledbetter, who we seem to understand as a sign that he really pushed hard for, really improved the team initially. And that sort of continued with Morgan, who's another guy who Jack Ross worked with before, who he was keen to bring in. So on a whole, I think he's done a good job in tough circumstances. He deserves great credit for improving the culture and the atmosphere around the club early on in the season. He maybe deserves a bit of stick for some of the draws we suffered in the middle of the season at Scunthorpe at Oxford. I think he was maybe a bit too conservative. I don't really like his mentality in games where we're 1-0 up. I think he looked at those games thinking, we're comfortable here. In fact, that's something he said in the media I thought we were comfortable and I'm watching these games thinking, no, we're not. Mm. No, we're not. The other team's got all the ball. We're not keeping it. If if anything, it's it's completely the opposite. And that that annoyed me a bit. But, mm. but on a whole, he's done a good job. And I think, yeah, I think most Sunderland fans are quite content to give him another go next year. Yeah, it's not in the nature of Sunderland fans, is it, to feel comfortable when 1-0 up? <laughs> no. <laughs> I, remember, I remember watching the, the, the Norwich game last season when we were at the second game of the season when we were 3-1 up. And someone put on Twitter, you're not a true Sunderland fan unless you expect to lose this 4-3. <laughs> <laughs> That's just how it is. But yeah, I think I think you I think you're pretty much I think you've hit the nail on the head there, Jimmy. I think especially for for maybe, you know, any 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 detractors from him, you know, you you've it's a very valid point to say that it, it, he seems to have some strange lapses in judgment when it comes to his like barometer for when we're comfortable. Being one nil up for any Sunderland fan isn't a comfortable advantage no matter how well you're playing. And that was epitomised, I think, in in the cup in the Checker Trade Trophy when you, you know, you won nil up and you were you were doing all right, but Portsmouth come Portsmouth were coming into the game more, and then you take off Will Grigg, you know, you you, you take the the you just you, yeah. you take you slice the tip off your sword there, isn't it? For balance, just the other thing I'd add as well is he's been good in games where we're behind, start of the season mm -hmm. substitutions, being proactive, making substitutions early. That's the key strength of his. So if I'm gonna say that I've been disappointed with him, what he's done in games we're winning. In games we've been level, in games we've been behind, I've been very impressed yeah. with his ability to switch the momentum in the game. So mm -hmm. just out of fairness, I thought I'd add oh, that. Completely, yeah. I mean, the mentality, it's its a team. I've i have heard the term banded around a lot this season, but it's, 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 it's true every time it's said. This is a team that doesn't know when it's beat. And Jack Ross has really, you know, given that the culture from the seasons before were a losing culture, you know, last season we were a team that if we went behind, we would stay behind and we would just completely capitulate. We're now a team that will fight to the very last second, which is again was epitomised in the cup final. At, at two one down, any a lot of other teams would have been beaten. Last season we wouldn't even have got that far. You know, with that mentality, but you know, out of nowhere in a game when Portsmouth were had the more energy and they were more on top, and it looked like they were going to see out a two one fairly comfortably. Out of nowhere, we get one back and it's 2 2. And there's just that, that, that never see die attitude. The Wickham game, we were crap for 92 minutes. And then out of nowhere, you just pull one back and then jobs are good. It's, uh, it's lo lo from losing positions, especially as you say, we're a team that has a never see die attitude. So that does balance things out for me very well. I'm, I'm totally on board with you there, Jimmy. We'll go to you, Jeff. If you were going to just like rate Jack Ross in a similar fashion, what would you go with him as a 
as a summary and a grade? I think he's done a great job. Um, considering, I think a lot of people forget just how low the club was last summer. Um, it would not have surprised me before before Jack Ross came in and before Stuart Donnell and Charlie Methven came in. It would not have surprised me to see see them go straight the way through the divisions and, and end up in League Two because the whole feeling about the place um, was was awful. And I think people people do forget how how low things were and how bad it was. Um, the first time I met him was the day the fixtures came out. I did the fixtures breakfast for the um, for the foundation, and it, it, I would have thought just about everyone in the room had not. I didn't have a clue who Jack Ross was, and had never seen him before, and wouldn't have recognised him. And he, st- he, I did a forty-five minute Q and A with him, and everyone came out thinking, "Ah, oh, this guy's really got something about him." He's really got a, he's he's got a presence and he, he he talks sensible stuff. One of the things he said very early on, he said, "Look, it's going to be a bumpy ride. Um, it's June. I I've, I don't know who's going to be staying. I don't know which players I'm going to be able to sign. The season starts in about six weeks." Um, someone asked him, "You know, what's your team going to be?" And he said, "He said I'm not got a clue." Um, and that's to, to to be playing catch up and to have done what what he's done. Um, I think a lot of people thought think because it's Sunderland because the you know the crowds are twenty five thirty forty thousand then and the club should be up there but it it was such a hard ta- hard task to get them to where they are plus again I think people have very quickly forgotten that you know a lad who scored seventeen goals up to January and probably would have got you would have hoped twenty five maybe thirty by the end of the season has been taken out of the equation and and and. To lose that sort of firepower and still to have kept the team where they are, I think is is a great achievement. I mean, from our point of view, from media point of view, he's an absolute dream because he's a he's a he's a lovely guy to speak to. He's very open. He's very honest. Um, tells you one or two things off the record, which which not I can't remember the last Sunderland manager that uh, that did that. And I think if he if he's still here next season um, and. Touch wood. Uh, I think that it, it will be things will get better definitely. Mm-hmm. For a grade then, <laughs> maybe an A minus or a, something like that. Not much more he could have done. I don't think. No, I think that's. Uh, I think as you say again, that's another another fair fair sort of summary of how he's been. So we'll go to you, Josh, for the last one. Mm-hmm. Let's hear yours. Yeah, well, um, grade wise, I think I think I'd go B plus. I I like him. I I can only mirror a lot of what. Uh, what the fellas have said, I think again going back to you know the attitude of the players, like they're playing for him, and I, I don't remember the last manager we had where, where we've had that, and I think that's I don't think you can underestimate how important that is. Hey, hang on, hang on, Julian Lescott was uh, <laughs> really, really behind David Moyes. <laughs> um, I think you've just proved my point. Yeah, um, and I think that's huge. I mean, I do get the identity thing. And I was excited about him coming because, you know, when I heard that he was coming, I watched a bit of St Mirren and I thought, oh, they play some nice some nice attack and stuff. And I, and we saw that at the start and that kind of wavered and I'm not really sure why. But as well, I, I think you have to understand, coming from St Mirren to Sunderland in the state we were in, and as I mentioned earlier, he hasn't really had a transfer window, a full transfer window, um, in my opinion. I think he's done a great job. And, you know, there's been injuries along the way. Like you say, we, we lost Madger, which is tricky. So we've essentially, he's essentially rebuilt a squad and rebuilt a team. And him alongside, you know, Charlie and, and Donald have rebuilt a club in the space of nine months, ten months. About that. Which is pretty good going when you think about it. Oh, yeah. I mean, I was with a friend of mine who was just visiting and he's not a Sunderland fan. And he said, you know, oh, you don't, this isn't a League One club, like, because, you know, when we were outside the stadium, obviously the fan zone was packed and we got on the stadium, the flags were gone. And it was just like, yeah, we, we, we're not. Like, we don't feel like a League One club. It feels incredible. And that's changed so much in the space of a year. So as we touched on earlier about, you know, if, if we are in League One again next season, hopefully we'd have Jack Ross. I don't see why we wouldn't. Um, I think I, I'd be quietly confident about mm-hmm. our chances. What's the buzz, Jeff, um, to you sort of with the Scotland job? I mean, I know that you sort of batted it away. What's what sort of the sense you get? Um, well, he has he has batted it away, but um, he will be on the radar. He's bound to be yeah. bound to be on the radar because they they need something. Scotland need something a little bit left field, and instead yeah. of dragging out yeah. the old guys who've done it all before. 
Um, please not Gordon Strachan once. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, so he um, and I, th- I think p- probably the the biggest threat uh, may come from um, for if if promotion isn't achieved this season, may come uh, from the owners uh, who who will possibly feel that they were you know. That has to be the bottom line. That promotion is is the only thing, and there will be a. There has been a bit of friction, I think, through the through the course of the season, partly because it you know it's it's new to them, it's new to the owners, and and partly because they are desperate, absolutely desperate, to get the club uh, promoted, and and that that hasn't always sat easily. Uh, but I would hope they would you know they would see as well that what a good job. Jack yeah, Ross has done. I guess yeah. with Eastley as well, was it four different managers in sort of three years? So, so there is there is sort of that history there that mm. if Stuart sees something he doesn't like, that he might act. I think that we should be looking at ways to get better if we don't go up, but I don't necessarily that think that should be pointed at Jack Ross. I think maybe no. if you look at Tony Coton and Richard Hill, you look at sort of recruitment, and and once again, it's the same thing. It they they're coming into it late. In August, you kind of have to give them the benefit of the doubt because of the sheer volume of players that to bring in. Mm. That to bring in star players, that to bring in squad players, and everything in between. But then you look at how January went, and that was one they did have time to prepare for. That was one they did have time to plan for, and it was sort of it didn't quite go to plan. Grig hasn't quite panned out. I mean, he got injured midway through January, which obviously changed things dramatically. But that's maybe an area where you're thinking, could we be better? Should we have done things differently? Do we have to change our approach? I don't think it should necessarily be the managers to figurehead will be simplistic. Does mm. Ross stay or go? I think there's other aspects of the club yeah. it, that it, could be run better. It was interesting in that first that uh, interview we did with him on uh, on fixtures day. He, again, he, he was asked who you're going to sign. He said, he said, look, there will be players I will sign who you will say what. And there'll be players that are signed who you'll think, oh, that's not bad. And other players that you will never have heard of. Yeah. But he's, and, uh, his, his analogy, which he used at the time, was he said, look, if your boiler's broken, what would you rather have? Would you rather have uh, uh, you know, someone who's time served coming in to do it or a young lad fresh out of college? And everyone's sort of, oh, well, someone who's done <laughs> the time. He said, well, yeah. that's, in League One, that's what you need. You need, and, uh, you need people who are time served, who know this division, because it is, it is so tough to get out of. And it is different. It's not the quality of the Championship in the Premier League. Um, so he said... And, and at the moment, I've just got to get bodies in. And I think there was a rush of the likes of Leuvens and Austin yeah. were bodies. Yeah. That, and, and at times this season, I think everyone's looked at it and thought, so many players and nobody really knew what was the best the best team. I think he's struggled with that a little bit. Mm-hmm. This season, the probably. other thing as well is sort of on that subject, and it's something that we've, we've touched on many times before, so we don't need to go into great detail on, is Oviedo and Catamol both staying when they're expected to go and how that changes. You bring in Ozturk thinking Oviedo's going and you can bring in a star and then, oh no, Oviedo's staying, there's not a market for him. You think Catamol's going, you don't include him in your first squad. Oh, he's staying, so yeah, knock a million off that fee that we can pay for him. Mm-hmm. And that obviously dramatically changed things as well, which is something that's out of Jack Ross's control and mm. to an extent out of everyone's control, the recruitment team, Charlie... And Stuart, I mean, I think as things as it stands at the club, the cohesion between the board and the manager is there. But obviously, there are perhaps suggestions that every decision made will not be entirely one made by Jack Ross with Jack Ross's consent. There may be cases where what he says is overridden by Stuart Donald, and that's the nature of of, of him owning the club. He's entitled to do so. On the podcast when we interviewed Stuart, he said that if he, if he was under the conviction that a, a player was not committed to the club and that they did not want to be here, he wouldn't want Jack Ross to play them. Mm-hmm. And of course, that's Stuart's philosophy. You know, you won the club, you make the ethos. That's just generally how it goes. But you can imagine that there's a, a there's the potential for a disagreement there. And while there's obviously been very little whispers of that so far, it, it, remain, it remains a possibility. Not to say it will happen, just that it could happen. But I think that's, that's just how things go. So just a very quick whip round before our last little segment. What was your grade, Jimmy? Um, I think we're getting a B minus. B minus, Jeff. Uh, A minus. A minus, and Josh. B plus. B plus. So overall, oh mine. I think every, everything considered, Jack Ross gets a B for me on the dot on the head. Just a B. I think, as we've said before, he, um, as you've said, Josh and I agree entirely. He's not at a full transfer window. He's had to throw a whole team together out of nowhere. He's he's got some things wrong, 
but he's got an awful lot of things right and the positives for me outweigh the negatives. It's been a good season. I've enjoyed it. If we've got to stay in League One next season to, to keep building, to consolidate, to improve, to go up, so be it. I, I think that, I think it is what it is, plain and simple. Obviously, it's it's not what we want. It's disappointing to stay in this division because it's a crap division. But, uh, you know, to put it bluntly, but <laughs> I, 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 I want to go up as much as the next, the next man or woman. But if we need to stay down because we need to keep building, then Rome wasn't built in a day. And, you know, fixing up this what was a shell of a football club it can't be done overnight and I think it's possibly a bit idealistic to assume that we could just improve it in one season given how much of a state we were in not too long ago so our last little section will be our quick question segment we'll just do a quick whip round for um, your predictions here because we've already spoke at length about these but basically we asked this time for our quick question this week how do you feel about the prospect of Sunderland in the playoffs do you reckon we'll win and the responses I think on the whole weren't particularly positive but as everyone's entitled to their opinion let's just dive straight in Anthony says it's a lottery but we've proven in spells that we can tear apart Pompey, Barnsley, Charlton and Doncaster we need to kill teams off when we have them on the ropes if the fans get behind them I really think the team is are capable of finishing the job Michael Irwin says think except for Doncaster or Peterborough the other teams we face are better than us and in form so don't expect to even get to Wembley Dan Honor says, depends on how the next two games go. We need momentum, which we don't have. If we go up, we'll struggle in that league. Another season in League One won't do any harm. Chris Swinton says, we have as much chance as whoever we're playing. The squad has the ability to get promo- to get the job done. I just hope that's enough left in the tank to get us over the line. Let's not forget that we're practically a new team from the players up to the owners. Rome wasn't built in a day. And Ian says, no not with a defence that can't defend or pass a ball two yards. And how are our strikers going to score goals when they can't hit a barn door? A lot of money spent on them and no return. So just from the feel of what we've heard, what do we think? We'll start with you, Jimmy. I like the last one. I think yeah. I think he had a few beers and <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> was moving his thumbs late on Tabby Saturday. Me, I like that. Um, honestly, I'm not sure. I think I sort of agree with the sentiment that we need to see the draw first. And I'm sort of of your thinking, Alex, that there is a, quite big difference and it's quite a big ask to beat Charlton over two legs Mm -hmm. and then turn around and beat Portsmouth we've got sort of an older squad we've got players playing through niggles and I do wonder whether that would be too much so Mm -hmm. I also really just don't like Lyle Taylor and I would love another team to knock his team out so we didn't have to play him yeah yeah he yeah that's that's the best outfield performance I've seen this season I think him at the Valley I mean definitely yeah, yeah, him him against Baldwin and Reese James didn't didn't go too well for them. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so as things stand, I'd edge towards Wembley heartbreak, but but it's 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 all up in the air. Who knows? I mean, yeah. we're, we're evenly matched those four teams. Mm-hmm. What do you think, Jeff? I I think we said it before. It's, it, it's all about momentum, and other teams have it, and Sunderland don't at the moment. So maybe it depends what happens in the last two games of the season. Can they? Uh, uh, can they pick up a couple of wins that would send them into the playoffs in good spirit? As it stands, I don't know. I'd be pleasantly surprised if they made mm-hmm. it to Wembley, but I would fear that they uh, that they maybe wouldn't. And Josh, um, I I think we could do it. I do. Um, I I think we can. You know, and and if and if we get if we play Charlton over two legs and we don't beat them, then we don't deserve to go up. And it's it's as simple as that. Mm-hmm. And you, you can't. You can't kind of. I don't think you can dwell on it too much, and I don't think you can look at it as a failure. I mean, maybe you can, but I'm not massively worried about it. I'm just, I'm just, you know, let's just take it as it comes, mm-hmm. and we play who we play. And I totally agree. I think we need to win the last two to get some momentum. And if we, if we, if we do that, then we're going in as best we can. And then it's pretty much a lottery, though. To be fair, I mean, we could play these last two games. Lyle Taylor could get an injury. In their last two which games. would be absolutely fantastic. You just don't know. I mean, <laughs> or we could get a, a bad injury, and which would just, be absolutely terrible. Which would be terrible. Mm. And you just don't know. I mean, there's still you know 180 minutes of football to be played, and it's cliche, but it's true. And anything can anything can still happen. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I want to maybe just dive back into what um, uh, Mike Lowen said there in, in one of our quick question replies. He said that except for Doncaster or Peterborough, the other teams we would face are better than us. Uh, yeah, disagree with that I, one. I, I yeah, I, I, re- I mean, I, I obviously, as we say, it's game of opinions football, but I really disagree with that one. I think, I think Charlton have players who have can have moments of brilliance mm-hmm. that would definitely sort of 
break through our defence should they be having an off day or just a lapse of judgment. As we've said, someone like Lyle Taylor, you know, if, if Flanagan maybe just just like maybe just cock something up in, in the moment, you know, he can just he could just like twirl through him and score. That, that 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 could happen very easily. But I think if we were just going pound for pound overall, I would say we probably have the best squad on paper out of any of those teams. Mm-hmm. I think Pompey's defence is better than ours, but mm-hmm. I think all over the park, we're better than them. I think. I think Jamal Lowe's a poor man's McGeady. I'm just gonna put that out there. That's interesting. I think. Um. I. F- I, f- I think whoever their number nine is, I didn't rate him at all. He didn't get a sniff. I. I don't think. I don't think Pompey that good. I mean. I mean. Obviously, McGillivray had a cracking game, but I think he goes with the defense, doesn't he? Yeah. And then you've got. Um. Charlton. I like uh, yeah. their number seven. And then Don't Can't good. remember their name. Can't remember his name. Post number seven. I like their midfield. Um. But I think yes. Yesterday we showed that they're beatable. No, oh, um, completely. I oh, know we mm. didn't beat them. Um, played another ten minutes, would have got a goal. But I think we should. We can beat them. I think as well. We have one other one that I wanted to keep separate, just because I think that one's worth considering all on its own. Uh, the last one, the last reply I've got down here is Martin Hunter, who said, "I think Jack Ross has no clue what his best team is. The only settled position is keeper. The rest of the spine is totally unsettled. I'd love to see O nine in midfield, and Maguire needs to play in the next couple of games. Grig was the epitome of a panic buy, complete waste of money. So." We'll go to you, Jimmy. What do you think? Is I there think anything there that you particularly stands out to you as controversial or as very, very relatable? Well, I think he doesn't know his best defence is, which is a big problem that this is, late in the yeah, season and totally something true. you wouldn't expect. I think against the better teams in this league, I think we probably do know our best front six. I think it's probably Wyke. Actually, I don't know if we do. I don't know if Honeyman, Honeyman or Maguire deserves to start in that 10 role. But I think... Catamol and Power gives us better balance than sort of a midfield with Leadbitter and Power. So I think that would stay true. I think we know Morgan and McGeady are our best forwards. I think White starts ahead of Grigg. In terms of the Grigg stuff, um, he has been a disappointment, but I think with the ankle injury, with the style of football we play, maybe, maybe there were better options. Maybe we were better trying to get a striker who can get his own shot, who can create chance for himself. I mean... Just after we signed him, I did the extra podcast with a Plymouth fan, and he said, we don't create as many chances as promotion-chasing teams he's seen in League One in the past, and for that reason, he didn't think Grigg would be a good fit here because he's someone who thrives on service, who thrives on being in the penalty box. And I think we have seen that to an extent. I do wonder whether there were other options that would be better than Grigg, but I don't see Grigg as a flop. I don't see him as a bad player. I think he's shown enough. I mean... He scored some really high quality goals for us, but I do wonder whether he was the best option at the best time mm-hmm. and whether we got too much tunnel vision in terms of going for him. And that was obviously a sign that we know from the podcast we recorded that Stuart Donald was adamant about pushing through. And you do wonder whether if we'd been a bit less emotional, if we'd been a bit colder in who would be best served for us, whether we'd have come to a different solution with mm-hmm. hindsight. So that Grig, Grig's an interesting one. It's another dilemma. I don't really have an obvious answer for but I find it quite interesting that he hasn't quite delivered in the way we expected Yeah, but I think it's unfair to call him a flop uh, he's not a flop no I think he's got some he's got some good goals this season and, and, mm-hmm. and those goals have you know they've made the difference they have you know it, if you haven't got someone there you know I mean I mean, sorry he's a young lad I'm not going to slate him this early in his career but Castellan's not going to do the same job he's you know he's a young lad he's, he's played a what he played 11 mm-hmm. minutes of professional football prior to coming to Sunderland. You know, he, was, he wasn't going to be the replacement. Mm-hmm. He's just an option. But with 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 Greg, yeah, um, there probably, the probably were better options. Didn't Greg score a couple of important goals in the Czech trade, though? Like on He's, the route to the final? He scored one against Bristol, Bristol Rovers. Rovers. Yeah. yeah. And I that mean, was that. Even if someone like that, just getting to Wembley was quite good for the club. Hey, so yeah, it's he, like he's, he's he's definitely he's, contributed. Yeah, he's he's made an impression. So it, I suppose it depends on it depends on how you look at things. Yeah, I think it was the Walsall game where it was Wyke flicked it into him and he took one touch and buried it in the corner from twenty yards. I think it was Walsall. It was Walsall Scamford, sort of yeah. generic. It was what it was struggling Walsall. side yeah, in League yeah. One, but, struggling but side number six in. The I remember thinking one. there's very few players in this league that score that goal. I remember yeah. coming away from that game mm-hmm. thinking, "Go, yeah, here we go." We're going to see the best of Grig now, and it hasn't really happened. But, but yeah, the talent's definitely there. Completely. Whether it's whether it's on Ross, whether it's on him, whether it's a combination of both, we haven't seen the best of him. But I think the talent's there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think I think that's probably a good place to leave it. I think going into the last games, we're probably we've probably got a mix a mix of feelings really going into it. There were definitely positives, but there's still margin for error. 
and I think however the the playoff finals transpire is up in the air. It could go anywhere, but I think all you've got to do is keep the faith. I think that that's the bottom line. There's 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 really no point in putting them down at this point in the mm-hmm. season. You've got to just get all hands on the pump and hope for the best. So we'll just round it off with a round of predictions in. Normally we we'll predict the next game, but as there's two left in one week, we'll predict the Fleetwood game and then the South End game. Starting with you, Josh, how mm-hmm. do you think they'll go? Two wins. Two wins. What, yeah. do, you, what do you think they'll be? Give, me, give me some scores. Give me some scorers. Go two one against Fleetwood. Yep. Courtesy of who? Oh, um, Wyke and Maguire. Nice. And then two nil against Southend. Two to who? Goal scorers again. Yeah. Um, power. Mm-hmm. And or nine. Yeah. For a random one. Yeah, yeah. I, I can see that. No, I can see that. What about you, Jeff? Uh, I'm going with one one and one one. So if, oh, you, yeah. if you go for one one this season, Probably right. more often than not you're going to be right you're, you? you're the most likely hater to win any money if we're betting yeah. 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 one one yeah, so who's, who's going to score our, our ones who's going to score blimey maybe Honeyman on Tuesday night and then I'd like to see Will Grieg get another one Aye. yeah I'm sure that'll be great I can't wait for Joey Barton's open top bus around <laughs> oh, we, we threw against the Mackhams twice this season uh, <laughs> yeah anyway Jimmy, what do you reckon? Yeah, two wins, why not? Um, Good lad. 2-1 against Fleetwood, we'll say Morgan and Wyke, and yep. then 3-1 against Southend, Grig Brace and Power. Brilliant. Yeah, I like that. I like that. I'm going to go with a 2-0 win over Fleetwood, and I'm going to go with my scorers. I reckon it's going to be... I reckon Wyke will get the first, and I reckon... No, sorry, I reckon Morgan will get the first in his early in his good early on spell, and I think Wyke will get the second. And then I think against Southend, you're going to win 4-1. I think it's going to be a rout because I don't rate them at all. I think they're a pretty poor side. And I think your goals... I'm going to go for quite a selection of strikers here. I'm sorry, just six of players. I'm going to go for Wyke, Grigg, Morgan again and Maguire. So I think we're going to score six without reply in the next two games. And that'll set us l- perfectly to play... I thought I was the optimist. <laughs> yeah, to play poor, trembling Doncaster over two legs again. Yeah. Get two more wins over them and then we're off to Wembley. Bish bash bosh jobs are good. But yeah, so thank you very much, um, uh, lads, for coming in today. Thank you very much, Jimmy, for making your trek up to Sunderland and coming into the studio today to share your opinions with yeah, us. Yeah, very, very rare that I'm in Sunderland for three days, so I yeah. thought it would be yeah, nice to pop by. Yeah, I think overall I'm going to say um, Jimmy Lawson, four out of ten, had some bright spells, <laughs> but was yeah, ultimately quiet for the, for the oh, most part, you know. Tyus Browning likes this. Yeah, t- <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, there's been a lot of players, a lot of players, brothers and siblings getting the retribution on here. Mm. So yeah, and thank you very much, Josh, for coming in. It's nice to see you back. My pleasure. Great stuff. And thank you very much, Jeff. Pleasure. Good stuff. So, fun. yeah, here's hoping we get six points and then a lovely run to Wembley, capped off with a win in the capital. Thank you very much, and we will see you next week. Some exchange betting companies run short-lived promotions, like months-long offers of low commission. At BetDAG, we wanted to change the way we did things, so we set our commission at 2% permanently. That's 2% on football, horse racing, golf, almost any sport. 2%. That's just one way that BetDAG is changing for the better. For the better, like you. BetDAG, the 2% commission exchange. Over 18s only, please gamble responsibly.